Hate to interrupt you from all your fabulous fellowship, but welcome to Fayette Baptist Church. Glad you're here. Welcome to our worship service. In light of that last statement, I have a question for you. Why are you here to worship? Now, there's approximately 150 or so adults here, and it could be 150 different responses. Probably not. Some of you correlate. But I want you to think about that. Why am I here to worship? You're here to... You know who you are to worship, right? God. The one and true God. But why? What brings you here? Some of the songs that we will sing. Beautiful one. Grace, grace. Mighty is to save. Maybe you're here to worship God because you feel blessed. And that's wonderful, isn't it? But maybe, hopefully, if you're having a job week or a month or a year, you're still here to worship the one and true God. So let's pray about that as we go to worship Him. Dear Heavenly Father, we need to stop and think about these things. Lord, and in honesty and motivation, why we're here to worship. We know who we are to worship, and that is you, period. And Lord, irregardless of the state that we find ourselves in emotionally and physically, we'd like to think that when we come here, we're going to acknowledge you. I want to give you the worship, the praise, the honor, the glory that you so deserve from our hearts and our mind, in our total being, heart, mind, soul, and strength, as your word says. And uh, get those entities of our being in that place so that as this team that stands behind me, dear Lord, that leads us in that direction of worship, that we become a unit. Even though we all may come here for different individual reasons to worship you, Lord, we become that one unit of praise and worship in this very moment in history. Um, may it be pleasing in your sight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
shared my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you You open my eyes to your warmth Yeah. 
strong and mighty who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty lift up your hands be lifted up let the redeemed declare the love as we bow down from Kiss the feet of hope and grace. Sing, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Lord God, you are the King of glory, and we have come here, as Pastor Glenn said, to worship you this morning. And Father, I just pray that that would be more than words that we sing, Lord, that, that you would fill our minds and renew our minds with that truth, that you are the King of glory, that you are seated on your throne right now. Despite what's happening in the world, we can keep our eyes on you. And Lord, may that truth go down right into our hearts and enable us to live as citizens of your kingdom. Not a far off future kingdom, but a kingdom of God that's available to us right now. Thank you that you enable us, that you've called us, each of us, your lost sheep, uh, and given us that invitation to be citizens of your kingdom. And your kingdom, Lord, is righteousness, peace, and joy. So we pray that by the power of your spirit, you would enable us to lead right lives, that you would give us your supernatural peace, Lord, and that we would have such radical joy in the face of everything that's going on in the world, because our hope is secure in you, that the world would stand up and take notice, and that we would be a people on mission, realizing that you are still moving in this world, you are still calling your lost sheep home. Help us to enter into that work that you're doing with joy and thanksgiving. Bless this service. Bless Pastor Chris as he brings the message this morning and the Sunday school workers and just everything that happens in this place. Lord, we dedicate it to you. In your name, amen. amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> A few announcements to share with you. First, uh, coming right up on September 8th is our family picnic and baptism. It's not too late to sign up to be baptized. As a matter of fact, it's never too late. You could run right in the water uh, on the day, um, but the pastors would love to talk to you about that beforehand. Um, so if you are interested in being baptized, if you have not taken that step of obedience and following Jesus, 
uh, invite you to speak with one of the pastors today. And there is a sign-up sheet out at the Welcome Center um, to sign up for side dishes for that picnic. The main meal is being provided, but if you can provide a side dish, go ahead and put your name out there and what you're bringing. Next, we have um, our Mexico mission trip coming up in October. And once again, we're selling coffee from Mexico. Uh, so this, this is coffee that's grown by the local farmers in Cuadatola, the village that our team goes to. Um, so I love this fundraiser because um, of each $12 bag of coffee, $5 goes to fund the team, $7 goes directly to the farmers in Cuadatola. So it's really a win-win. There's a limited amount of coffee available, so don't move yet, but rush right out after I stop talking and um, sign up to uh, reserve your bags of coffee. Next, uh, the Women's Fall Retreat. So this is coming up September 21st. That's a Saturday, and it's a one day from 9.30 to 5 at Kineawatha Park in Wilton. Thrive is coming. And if you're not familiar with Thrive Ministries, many of you are, but they're an outdoor ministry that really is experiential living out your faith. Um, and so uh, Heather Litchfield from Thrive is gonna be there with us, leading us through a bunch of different activities for all ages, all skill levels. Um, there'll be the opportunity to both be in the water and be on shore. Um, so don't let it be a barrier to you coming. It's $15 for the day. You're gonna bring a bag lunch and we're gonna provide snacks. Um, so really hope that every woman in the church knows that you are invited and we would love for you to be there with us. There's a sign up sheet out at the Welcome Center. And next, because not only are there women but men, come on up, Jerry Sorois, and tell us about the men's fall retreat. Good morning, church. How y'all doing? I'm not as uh, fluid as Molly at giving uh, announcements, but I'm going to do my best. So, uh, The men are going to be having a uh, uh, fall retreat. We do this pretty much every year. Um, this year we're going to be having it at Blueberry Mountain Bible Camp in Weld, Maine. And we really just want to take this opportunity to speak to every man that is part of this church and invite you personally um, to this event. We think that it's uh, a great time for us to get to know each other, to have fellowship together. And in this case, we're really excited about the venue. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful place um, up on a mountain. The, I think the, uh, the driveway going in there is probably a couple miles long. So, <laughs> um, But more importantly, um, the topic that we're going to be discussing is about being a Christian in our lives, not just here at church or with our families, but more importantly, um, or as importantly, uh, in our work field. We spend a lot of time at work, in the world around us. We really want to explore that subject together, and um, we think that God's Word has a lot to say about that. And we'd like to learn about that with you guys if you're interested in being part of that. So um, the retreat is going to be September 27th and 28th. Uh, it's going to start roughly around 5 o'clock on Friday. Uh, we'll have supper and there'll be some teaching. And then Saturday morning be a great breakfast and some more teaching and then lunch because we like to eat, right? Um, there'll be a bunch of events, but... Uh, it's just a time to get away and to um, maybe work on ourselves a little bit and hopefully leave there a little different than we got there, okay? So uh, I think that's pretty much it in a nutshell. We're going to have a uh, sign-up sheet um, after church in the cafe. You guys can sign up if you're interested. Uh, the cost for going is $64 if you're going to attend both days. And if you're only going to do Saturday, it's 22. Uh, we think that would be a great advantage for you to be there for both days because there's a lot of teaching happening Friday night. So, um, But please do not let the money part of it become an issue for you. If you're interested in going and you can't afford to, just let me know. 
we'll take care of it for you, okay? So just, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, one side note I should let you know that um, we're going to have a special guest doing music there this year. Uh, many of you know Eric Jewett. He's going to be leading music for us at the uh, retreat, so we're really excited about that. So in the, between now and then, please, uh, please lift this event up in prayer. And uh, I really want to extend again, every man in this church, um, we really would just love to have you join us. Some of you guys have been coming here for a long time, and you, you don't take part in that, but you're missing out. You're really missing out. So love you all, and uh, just thank you very much for this time. Thanks, Jerry. And I assume teens are welcome as well, Jerry? Because I was going to say that. I think both men and women, we always invite our Ignite Age teens to attend as well. So um, at this time, children are dismissed for Sunday school, and you can greet one another. Thank you. Rosie.
have a seat. Good morning. I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Chris Blanche. If you are visiting with us or if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, I have been away on vacation. And I'm not going to lie, it was awesome. I loved it. Um, and uh, it's good to be back, though. Uh, I, I, I got to say to, hi to most of you over here, you up there, a couple of you in the cafe. I know. Sorry, Marty. This whole side was neglected. I do like you. Hey, welcome. Good to see you. I, I do like you. I just ignored you. Um, so... Well, it is good to be back, and it's, <clears throat> you can feel there's, there's something in the air. This, this time of year, it's, uh, summer's come to a close, students are heading back to school, and uh, teachers are heading back to school. It's funny, they all have a little bit of a mopey look on their face today, if you talk to the students and, and teachers. Um, but I thought before we, before we jump into our, our text for this morning, I want to take a moment just to pray. Um, and to pray specifically for our, our students who are, a lot of them heading off to college, uh, some of them going off to college for the first time. We pray for their parents who are grieving. Um, this is a hard transition, but also just, this is it's exciting too, right? And, and I think it's important to recognize that they're, they're going out on a mission, right? This is exciting. So teachers, you're going back into your classroom. Students, you're heading back to classrooms. You're on mission. And, and I'm going to be praying that, that you'll shine bright and that people will see the love of Jesus in, in you. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the incredible privilege we have to gather in this place to, to worship you, to I- encourage one another, to, to spend time praying with another, talking to one another, sharing both the joys and the burdens that we have with one another. And we thank you that, that we have your word. We thank you that we have this truth that we can stand on and that we can take one another to. And we thank you for the incredible privilege we have to, to be a part of, of the family of God. We recognize that our ability to be part of your family came at an incredible cost that you sent your son to to die in our place. But you are a God who searches for the lost, and we thank you for that. But I also thank you, God, that, that... when we became part of of, of your family, that you have given us a mission. And we get to be your representatives in this lost and broken world. And we have an opportunity every day to represent your son, Jesus, and to introduce others to him. We know that there is freedom nowhere else but through your son. Lord, I just I want to take a moment to, to pray for my brothers and sisters who are, are heading off to school here in the, in the coming week. We thank you for each of them, both students and teachers alike. God, I pray your blessing on them. I pray that this year will be a year that they look back on and say, wow, did I grow closer to God. And wow, look at the amazing things that God did as I walked in obedience to him. I pray that they would shine bright wherever you take them. And I pray that through their faithfulness to you and to your word, that others would come to know your son, Jesus. And Lord, I I just want to thank you again for this time as we now open your word. I pray that you would speak to us through it. I pray that you would give us a passion and a hunger to, to, to know your word to apply it to our lives and to share its truths with others. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I got so excited talking to everyone. Uh, 
but I didn't, I didn't come up and get my Bible ready and my message ready before or during the break. I usually do that. Um, it's exciting to be back in the book of Luke today. We are making our way through the gospel of Luke. Um, and today we're in a new chapter, chapter 15. You can turn there if you'd like. I'll never, ever forget uh, the, the panic and the grief that simultaneously flooded my heart uh, roughly 22 years ago when I was, I was working at my office desk and, and I looked down at my hand for some reason typing and, and I noticed that there was something missing. Uh, my, my wedding ring was missing. And, you know, up to that point, Jen and I, we had been married about three years at, at that point. And for three years, that ring never left my finger. I mean, like most newlyweds, I, I fiddled with it a lot. You know, when you first get it, it's like, I've never had something on my hand before. This is kind of strange. But it never left my finger. But there it was, or there it wasn't, right? I'm looking down. It is gone. Raise your hand if, like me, you've ever experienced that feeling. All right. All right. I'm not alone. And it was, I mean, it's a terrifying feeling, right? Because in that moment, I know that my life is almost over, right? <laughs> I need to call my wife and tell her what I've done. I've lost my wedding ring. And the feelings of grief and, and panic were both simultaneous and intense. I, I, was, I was sad. I was really sad. Well, fortunately for me, however, those feelings did not last for too long. I picked up the phone uh, at my office desk, and I called Jen to break the news. And she gently reminded me that it was just a ring. We were still married. <laughs> yeah, we were still married. And, and, and while it was important and special to both of us, it was just a symbol of our love and commitment to one another. By the way, just I want to throw this out. I, I was writing down the, the thoughts about this, this really momentous occasion in my life, this, this heart-wrenching moment. And I said, Jen, I just want to make sure I got the details right. It's been 22 years, and my memory's not what it used to be, so I just want to make sure I got this right. And she said, I honestly do not remember this. <laughs> like, you don't remember? This was so severe for me. I, like, I was like wrecked over, over this. And she's like, yeah, I don't remember it. She reminded me, though, at that time, she was chasing three children, and she's like, yeah, I'm not really worried so much about your ring. But so I hung up the phone with Jen, and with her reassurance behind me that you know, she wasn't going to kill me, we, we put our heads together, we put our heads together and, and said, well, gosh, it, it can only be in so many places, right? I mean, we, I, my office is three miles from, from the house, and so she's like, we're going to find it. So I went out to the car, and I'm searching the car, I'm searching my office, I'm like, where could this be? And... Um, and Jen started searching around the house, and um, she found it. Uh, she found it. She found my ring. It was laying on the, the floor next to my nightstand. Um, and I mean, to this day, I still don't know how it got there. I mean, I was a lot thinner then, and so it's possible my ring was, it, it doesn't move now. But at that time, it it, it certainly could have just slid off the night. Or I don't know, maybe it was bothering me and I pulled it off. And I don't know. But I do know the, um, the, the feelings of panic when it was gone. And I know the joy that I felt when it was found. I was so relieved. Well, this morning, in our continuing study of Luke's gospel, we, we are picking up a new chapter, chapter 15. And this entire chapter, sometimes called really the heart of Luke's gospel, uh, it contains one clear message, and that is this. God seeks lost sinners, and there is joy and celebration with God in all of heaven over lost souls being found. In this chapter, we get to see the heart of God towards those who are lost, which, by the way, includes all of us, right? At one point, we were lost, and we have been found. 
And this chapter is made up of three parables that Jesus shared. There's the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, which is more commonly known as the, the parable of the prodigal son. And in each of these parables, what we see is the joy and celebration of God and heaven over the lost being found. According to Jesus, according to Jesus, this is the reason why he came. If this, is, if this chapter is the heart of Luke's gospel, you could say the, the, the theme verse for Luke's gospel is Luke chapter 19, verse 10, which we'll get to in about three years. Um, <laughs> Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came to seek lost sinners, sinners like me, like you. And there is joy and there is great celebration with God and the angels in heaven when those who are lost are found. Now, ideally, ideally, we we, we would study all three of these parables in one sitting, But because that would be a lot of ground uh, to cover, and I really do not want to rush through these, uh, what we're going to do this morning is we're just going to take a look at the first two parables, the parable of the lost uh, sheep and the parable of the lost coin, and then next week we'll take a closer look at the third parable, the parable of the lost son. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to be Luke chapter 15. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. Luke 15, verse 1. Now... The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. What Luke is doing here as he begins this this next section is he's setting the scene. He's laying out the context for these three parables that Jesus is going to teach. He is, he's describing the situation, the growing tension and frustration that the religious leaders were feeling towards Jesus. Now, we've seen a lot of tension from from the Pharisees and religious leaders already. Um, But a a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, when we were, when we were wrapping up chapter 14, Jesus was speaking, you remember, to a large crowd, right? Right? And he was delivering what was a hard message about the cost of being his disciple. What are the costs associated? He was was encouraging his listeners to count the cost and then willingly surrender their lives to him and to prioritize him above all else, right? It was a tough message. He, He wasn't pulling any punches with his listeners about what it would cost to be his disciple. And at the end of chapter 14, in the very last words, the very last words that Luke writes, Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, pay attention to what I'm saying and apply it to your life. Now, I know that we have talked about this before, but just as a reminder that the chapters and the verses that you see in your Bible, all those numbers that you see, those were not in the original Greek and Hebrew text. They, they weren't there. They, they were added later in order to help organize and to, and, and to help us quickly find and reference portions of Scripture. And, and I think you'll agree with me, they are, they are helpful, right? They're very helpful. But when Luke wrote this gospel, those, those numbers... They weren't there. So as Luke is wrapping up this tough teaching from Jesus, right, and and he's writing down these final words of what Jesus shared there, he said something like this. He said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then Luke said, let me keep writing. And he said, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to what? To hear him, right? He's saying, Jesus says, if you have ears to hear, let him hear, which triggers Luke to say, and you know who wanted to hear? The tax collectors and the sinners. They were drawing near. 
One of the things that becomes really obvious as we read through the Gospels is the way that sinners and the outcasts of society were drawn to Jesus and his message. Those who had been rejected, right? Those who had been written off by many in society and certainly by the religious establishment, they were welcomed, right? And they were loved by Jesus. Why is that? Why is that? Was it it because Jesus is soft on sin? Please shake your head no, Fayette Baptist Church. No, no. It also, it begs another question. If sinners were welcomed and loved by Jesus, are sinners welcomed and loved by you, by me, by this church, by the church global? In some places you would say yes, in other places you might have to be honest and say no. In Matthew chapter 11, we're told that Jesus' opponents, as a put down, as a put down, they call Jesus a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You see, Jesus wasn't afraid to spend time with them. He came to seek them, and so should we. And what Jesus shows us is that we can spend time with and even enjoy the company of non-Christians without entering into sin. Now, obviously there are warnings in scripture that we need to be cautious, right? As you're spending time with unbelievers, right? You have to be careful, right? We need to be wise. We need to be be careful not to put ourselves into unnecessary temptation and to set ourselves up so that we enter into sin. And as I said, don't, don't make the mistake of, of, of thinking that maybe, you know, well, Jesus must have been just soft on sin. That's why sinners were so comfortable drawing near to Jesus. Man, if you've read the Gospels, you know that Jesus never lowered the bar when it came to holy living, did he? Jesus didn't lower the bar. He, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Read the Sermon on Jesus raised the bar. You have heard it said this. Let me tell you something. Let's raise the bar a bit, Right? Jesus wasn't soft on sin. The the woman at the well, was Jesus soft on sin? No, he said, go and sin no more. But he loved and he welcomed sinners. He spent time with them. He invited them into a life-changing relationship with him. Fayette Baptist Church, I pray that we will always be a church family that welcomes the lost and the broken, lost and broken, please come in. Please come. But here's the good news. Jesus welcomes lost sinners, but he loves us enough not to leave us lost, right? He loves us enough to help us grow and change and become more and more and more like him, right? That's the truth of the gospel. And I just pray that we will always be a family, a gathering of believers who are passionate about introducing others to Jesus Christ and helping them to become his committed followers. Jesus loved and he welcomed sinners. But this absolutely drove the Pharisees and the scribes crazy. It, it, it made them go bananas. They couldn't stand it. See, in their minds, these were the types of people that should be avoided at all costs. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about, about tax collectors because we, t- we covered that in chapter 5 and we'll probably cover it again in Luke 19. But just know this, the tax collectors, these were, these were Jews who had turned their back on, on, on their fellow Jews and in an effort to get rich, they had gone to work for the Roman Empire collecting taxes for Rome. And not only did they collect the taxes for Rome, but they actually overcharged their, their fellow Jews. They overcharged them to line their own pockets. They, they were seen as traitors to their own people. And they were hated by the religious establishment and really by the, by the culture. But here was Jesus welcoming tax collectors and other known sinners. 
Pharisees could not understand how Jesus would allow them to draw near to him. They couldn't understand, they couldn't get their heads around the fact that Jesus, this rabbi who claimed to be the Messiah, welcomes and receives sinners and he eats with them. Now, this isn't the first time that, that this has come up, right? This is, this is something that's been bothering the Pharisees throughout Jesus' ministry. And you may remember from back in chapter five, when Jesus called Levi to leave his tax booth and follow him, Levi did. And what's the first thing that Levi did after he leaves his tax booth to follow Jesus? He throws a party with Jesus as the guest of honor, and he invites all of his tax collector friends and, and known sinners in the community to come and meet Jesus. They had a party. They had a party. And Luke tells us in, in, in verse 30 of, of that chapter that the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, what the Pharisees and the religious leaders had still failed to grasp is that Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. Jesus says that they are the reason that I have come. I, I've come to invite people to turn away from their sins. By the way, that's what repentance is, right? It's turning and, and choosing to go in a different direction, to follow Jesus, turning away from my sin and following Jesus. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. But the Pharisees, however, they were so concerned about becoming defiled by sinners that they showed no compassion towards them. They were, they were so concerned about maintaining their superficial facade of, of holiness that they made no effort to reach lost sinners. In fact, in their minds, tax collectors and sinners were a lost cause. They were lost. Most, most of the Pharisee, Pharisee, the rabbis of the Pharisees, they would refuse to even teach a tax collector. Don't even tell them the truth. It's a waste. They're a lost cause. But what the Pharisees failed to grasp was that they too, they too were lost sinners that Jesus had come to save. So I spent a lot of time setting up the context here because it's important. This is the context for these three parables. As the Pharisees and scribes continue to see these tax collectors and sinful people spending time with Jesus, right, eating with Jesus, and pressing in to, to hear Jesus teach, these religious leaders grumbled about Jesus. They're murmuring to, to one another. They, they are convinced that Jesus cannot be from God. He couldn't possibly be the Messiah, and, 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 and that is because they have completely missed the heart of God for rescuing lost sinners. And so Jesus says, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. Not one story. How about not two stories? Let me tell you three stories with, with different people and different scenarios. He's gonna have the first story, we've got, we've got a, a shepherd who's lost his sheep. In the second scenario, we have a, a woman who's lost a coin. In the third, we have a father who's lost a son. He's actually lost two. <laughs> We're going to talk about that next week, right? But, but three, th three different stories so that people can relate and understand the one common message and that God rescues sinners and there's great joy and celebration in heaven over sinners being found. That's the message and that's what he's sharing. In verse three, Luke says, so he, Jesus, told them this parable. Remember, a parable is, is a story using common uh, things in order, like scenarios in, in, in agriculture and in, in shepherding, in order to help people to teach one main truth. And the big mistake we make when we try to understand parables is sometimes we try to dissect every little piece of the parable and we miss the main 
point. And the main point for these parables is clear and, and it's set up by this context of this grumbling about Jesus spending time with lost sinners. Now, keep in mind also that when it says he told them the parable, the, who, who are the them in this context? Who's he talking to? Them who were grumbling and murmuring, right? He's talking to the Pharisees. They are the target audience for what Jesus is sharing. And these parables are a response to their grumbling. But they're not the only ones that are listening, right? Who else is listening? The, the tax collectors and the, and the known sinners who were gathering to hear Jesus teach. And, and man, what an encouraging message they were about to, to hear. A message that reveals the heart of God and how he feels about them. And I just, I just want to throw this out as we get into these parables this morning. I just like, if you are someone, you've never come to Jesus as, as to, to be your Lord and Savior, if you have not been yet rescued by Jesus, this is his heart towards you. This is how he feels about you. And I want you to, to hear that uh, in his parables this morning. Now, before we begin looking at these first two parables, let me just, I'm gonna tell you up front what the, the pattern that we're gonna see in both of these, all right? First, there's gonna be something of value that is lost. Something valuable is lost. Second, there is gonna be a diligent search for what is lost. And then third, there is gonna be joy and celebration when what was lost is found. So let's go ahead and start with the first parable, the, the parable of the lost sheep. Verse four, Jesus says, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So first, first we see that there is something of value that is lost. So in this first parable, that something is a sheep, right? Jesus says, imagine that you have a hundred sheep. That's actually really hard for me to imagine. I don't know about you. Anybody here have a hundred sheep? Anybody here have one sheep? All right, we've got one. Awesome. That's, it really could have gone, no hands going up, I'm thinking, in most, in most congregations, right? But this, this culture this would be something that they could totally relate to. They may, they may not have had sheep themselves, but they could relate to the idea of a shepherd and having sheep. But it is interesting, I should point out, that the fact that Jesus is asking, he's asking the Pharisees to put themselves into the shoes or the sandals of a shepherd. <laughs> the Pharisees, they don't, they, they don't like tax collectors, right? They really hate tax collectors. But Shepherds weren't a whole lot better in the minds of, of the Pharisees. This is, this is a stretch that Jesus is asking them to put themselves in the shoes of a shepherd. Because by the time of Jesus, I mean, which is interesting, because if you look at the Old Testament, the patriarchs, we're dealing with some good shepherds, right? How about King David? He was a shepherd. And God himself refers to himself as a shepherd of his sheep. And yet by the time of Jesus, shepherds were despised. They were at the bottom of the social structure. As John MacArthur points out, caring for sheep was the lowest of the legitimate occupations, ranking just above the outcast line, below which were tax collectors and other irreligious sinners. So Jesus looks at these proud Pharisees and says, imagine you're a shepherd. They would have been disgusted by such a thought. But she says, imagine though, imagine you have a hundred sheep and one of them is lost. 
Now, this wasn't exactly an uncommon scenario, right? Because sheep are not known to be the most intelligent of, of animals, are they? They're not. Which, by the way, should make you pause and think about the fact that God refers to you as his sheep. I don't think it's a compliment. I don't think it's like, wow, you guys are so smart. You're like sheep. Not at all. They are, they are prone to wander, and they require constant care. They are incredibly vulnerable, and they are unable to defend themselves against predators. By the way, if you've never read it, Philip Keller's book titled The Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm is a great resource, which provides some great insights into the, the shepherd and the sheep relationship. He was a shepherd with sheep, and so he, he provides a lot of great insight there. But, but here's the point. Here's the point that Jesus is making. There, there is a sheep that is lost, and that sheep is in trouble. And the only hope for that sheep is for the shepherd to go and find it, which is exactly the position that every one of us was in until Christ rescued us. Hope, hopelessly lost in our sins, right? But he didn't leave us there, did he? God the Father sent his son to rescue us. And so first, we, we see that there is something of value that's lost. And then second, we see that there is a diligent search for what's lost. Jesus says, which of you wouldn't leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Now, something you need to know about shepherds is that they were responsible for all of the sheep in their care. That seems like obvious, but you need to know that they were responsible for all the sheep in their care. As Warren Wiersbe points out, if a sheep was missing, the shepherd had to pay for it unless he could prove that it was killed by a predator. And to not find the lost sheep meant money out of his own pocket, plus the disgrace of being known as a careless shepherd. So you might be thinking, and I hope you are, well, if that's the case, if that's the case, then isn't it better to lose one than to put the other 99 in jeopardy. How many of you have read this parable before and you go like, I don't understand why he would leave the 99 to go after the one. That seems really irresponsible. Wouldn't it be better to just cut your losses and say, yeah, it's coming out of my paycheck. I'm gonna stay here with the 99. That stupid sheep keeps running off anyway. You know? Well, I read a lot of commentaries this week about this very question. And some commentators suggest that more than likely there, you know, there, there would have been you know, other shepherds that were there, either you know, with this flock or perhaps with flocks of their own. And there wasn't a lot of great pasture around, around Israel, too, so it was common for the people to kind of bunch together and, and take their flocks out to these common areas. So it's possible that he could have just left the 99 with them as he went in search of the one that is lost possible. Others suggest that maybe that's the point that Jesus is trying to make here is that just how radical a love must have this shepherd had towards finding this lost sheep that he would leave the 99 to go out and rescue the one. Here's the point that you need to know about the 99. The 99 are not the point of the parable. The 99 are not the point of the parable. This is where we get in trouble with parables, right? What, what's the point of the parable? God, the good shepherd, loves and seeks after lost sheep. That's the point. The good shepherd will seek after the sheep that is lost. And notice what Jesus says. He'll seek after it until he finds it. Until he finds it. The shepherd searches diligently for the lost sheep. Sheep. Okay, so first, so first there, there's something of value that's lost. Second, there is a diligent search for what is lost. Third, there is joy and celebration when what was lost is found. Jesus says in verse five, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders. Isn't that a great picture? 
rejoicing. Isn't that great? No doubt you have probably seen artwork depicting the shepherd carrying the sheep on his shoulders. He's not angry with the sheep. He's not like beating it, you know, like dumb, dumb sheep, you know. No, he loves it. He picks it up. He puts it on his shoulders. And by the way, I don't know, sheep can get kind of heavy, right? You know, 100 pounds maybe or so. That's, he's going to carry it all the way home. He's going to carry the sheep. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. He's rejoicing, it says. He's rejoicing. And, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Right? It's a joyful occasion. This is something to celebrate Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Now, again, step back. Who's hearing this? Pharisees are hearing this. They're grumbling about Jesus spending time with those who are lost, these tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus, you should be celebrating this. How strange, how strange would it be if, if the shepherd grabbed the sheep, put it on his shoulders, carries it home? How strange would it be if his friends and neighbors were like, well, that stinks? That stinks. You should have let it die. I wish it was still lost. Isn't that crazy? Like some friend you are, right? But that, don't you see? Don't you see? That's the reaction of the Pharisees here. That's how they're treating these lost sinners, these tax collectors. They're not rejoicing. God was rescuing tax collectors and sinners through his son, Jesus the good shepherd. And it was a joyful occasion. They should have been celebrating. Heaven was. Heaven was. Look at what it says in verse seven. Jesus says, just so, in the same way, I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What an incredible thought that there is joy in heaven whenever a sinner repents that God the Father celebrates when lost sinners are found. Isn't that great? We should be celebrating with them, shouldn't we? We should be. Now, don't, don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying. He's not saying. He's not saying that the 99 are actually righteous people who had no need for repentance. Like, is there any such thing as a person who has no need for repentance? Well, there was one, Jesus, right? But every other human being who's ever lived is in need of repentance. There are those who think they have no need for repentance, like the Pharisees that Jesus was addressing here. But the scriptures are clear that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? Romans 3, 23. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse six, we're told that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus came to seek lost sinners, and, and, and that's, Every single one of us, you, me, the tax collectors, the known sinners, and the Pharisees alike, we have all gone astray, and we all need to repent. Jesus says that when we do, there is, there's joy in heaven. There is joy and celebration with God in heaven over lost souls being found. That is the point of the parable. But just in case, just in case the audience didn't get it, Jesus said, let me, let me tell you another parable. Let me tell you another parable. Let me, let me say it in a different way. Maybe the Pharisees couldn't relate to the idea of being a shepherd. Maybe they'll understand if he asked them to relate to being a woman. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. They might have been even more offended at that thought, right, in that culture. In verse eight, he continues, he says, or what woman, 
having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I mean, can you see these are parables are very, very similar. In the first parable, Jesus invited his audience to put themselves in the shoes of a shepherd with a lost sheep. This one is a woman with a lost coin, one of 10 silver coins. Now, it was a, it was a drachma, which is a Greek silver coin that would have been equal in value to about a day's wages. So once again, there's, there, there's something of value here that is lost. And like the first parable, there is going to be a diligent search for what is lost. Jesus says, what woman wouldn't search diligently for this missing coin? I was thinking, like, if, if I suddenly was missing a day's wages, I'd probably like, try to figure out where it went, Right? Once she realized that the coin was lost, she would do whatever she could to find it. Just like my wife and I did, right? When we realized that my wedding ring was lost. We, you know, we never did throw a party and invite our friends to come and celebrate with us. You guys want to come over and celebrate it? My ring is found. You guys should come celebrate it. Let's have a party. You ready to cook for this many people this afternoon? All right, never mind. You can't come over. All right, sorry. But there's a celebration that's going to happen. Jesus says that this woman, she's going she's gonna, to she's gonna light a lamp and she's going to sweep the house. And you can picture her, right, looking for this. You can picture her with the, I brought one out, the Herodian oil lamps, those small little oil lamps, searching all through her home. You know, homes in that day, they didn't, a lot of homes didn't even have a window. And if they did have a window, it was probably pretty small. And so there's, they were dark. The, the rooms were we're dark. And so she's searching with an oil lamp, and then she can't find it, so she's sweeping the house with a broom. Again, hard-packed dirt floor. She's got the broom. She's sweeping. Maybe it fell, and it kind of got covered with a little bit of dust or dirt. She's sweeping around, looking for this lost coin until she finds it. And when it's found, just like the first parable, there is joy and celebration. Jesus says when, when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. For I have found the, uh, the coin that I had lost. Her friends celebrate with her. By the way, one of the commentators I read talked about just the, the, the beautiful picture of community here in a community like this, that, that there was, we share in the joys and the sorrows that we experience. And so her friends understand that she's really upset. She's lost this coin. And so they're, they're grieving with her. Maybe they were praying that she would find it. And then they celebrate with her when it's found. I think that's a good picture, and I think that's what the, the church family should be like, encouraging one another and, 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 and walking through those times of, of, of joy and loss together. But here's the thing. If, if there is joy and there is celebration over a lost sheep or a lost coin, how much more joy and celebration should we experience over lost souls who have been found. That's the point that Jesus is making with these, with these Pharisees. In verse 10, he says, just so, and, and again, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Both God and the angels of heaven rejoice and they celebrate when one sinner Repents. There is no greater cause for celebration than the news of lost souls being found, right? It is the best news that you could possibly hear on this side of, of eternity. It's the best news. And, and sometimes we treat it like, oh yeah, so-and-so, yeah, they came to Christ. Oh, oh good, that's cool. <laughs> what? No, this is big deal. That's why, by the way, baptisms are some of my favorite uh, services that we have. Not because people get saved at their baptism, but because they have been saved and they are publicly saying, I've been found, right? By the way, that whole term, like, I found Jesus, you didn't find him. He found you. He found you. And, and baptisms are a celebration that I've been found. I'll put another plug in. If, you've, if you're a follower of Jesus, 
he found you and you've never taken that step of obedience to, to be baptized, I'm encouraging you to come and talk to me. Talk to one of the other pastors and let's, let's, let's do this. It's two weeks we're having a baptism. We'd love to have you join us for, for that. There is no greater cause for celebration than lost souls being found. You know the words, the beloved hymn, right? You, we love this hymn, Amazing Grace. We celebrate lost sinners being rescued. By God's grace, lost souls have been found. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It's something to celebrate. Next week, we're going to look at the, at the third and the longest of these parables in chapter 15, parable of the lost son. But as we close our time together today, I just want to return to the words of Jesus from Luke 19. Jesus said, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost, right? He came to rescue lost souls. He came for tax collectors. He, he came for for fishermen. He came for the Roman soldiers. He came for the Pharisees as well. He came for Jews. He came for Gentiles. He came for the rich. He came for the poor. He came for the the young. He came for the old. He came for those who were educated, those who were not educated. He came for men. He came for women, right? Jesus came. He came for me. He came for you. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. By the way, a fun passage if you want to read it this week, Ezekiel chapter 34. We won't go there right now, but Ezekiel 34 talks about the fact that God is a shepherd who is going to rescue his sheep. By the way, rebuking the, 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 the religious leaders of the day in that, in that passage, rebuking them for the way that they had been self-serving and not loving and caring for the sheep. And he says, I will rescue my sheep. That's what God says in Ezekiel 34. And he, and he even talks about a prince who's gonna come from not, he says David, but David had already been dead for 500 years by the time Ezekiel wrote that, right? And he talks about the shepherd, the good shepherd that's gonna come and rescue his sheep. That's Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus says in, in John 10, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He willingly laid down his life for us. Right? He paid the price for our sins on the cross. Every single one of us at one time was that lost sheep in Jesus' parable, right? We were hopelessly lost. We, were, we, we could do nothing to save ourselves. And God said, I'm not okay with that. I've sent my son to rescue him, to rescue her. And when we repented of our sins and surrendered our lives to him, there was joy in heaven. These two parables don't deal a whole lot with the whole idea of repentance, do they? Come back next week, the next parable. And we'll be looking at that. But this is the clear message, right, of these parables, that God seeks lost sinners, and there is joy and celebration with God and all of heaven over lost souls being found. And I'll just say this, if you have never if you have never repented of your sins and surrendered your life to Jesus, he came to rescue you. And I pray that today would be the day that you would turn to him. He came to rescue. He is the good shepherd. And if you have questions about that, maybe you still have questions like, I don't understand all of this. Still talking in parables to me. I don't understand shepherd and sheep and all this. Let's talk. Come and talk with me. We'll, we'll, we'll sit down and talk more about this together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you for being the good shepherd who rescues. What a picture. What a picture, God, that, that I was one of those sheep who was lost, and you came to rescue Thank you for, for picking me up and putting me on your shoulders. And I thank you for all of my brothers and sisters here who likewise have been rescued. And I, God, I just, I pray that we as a, as a church would continue to celebrate the amazing work that you are doing still rescuing lost sheep. 
And I pray that by your grace that you would, you would include us, that you would continue to give us opportunities to, to share the good news with others, that they too might be found. And I pray that this week, that this week as we, as we go out and we go to our jobs and we go to school, God, help us to shine bright, that, 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 that people would see something in us and what they would see is the love of Jesus. That, that tax collectors and, and sinners today would be drawn to us. Not because we're great, but because you're great. I pray that they would see you. We surrender our lives to you today. And we ask you to lead us this week. And, and Lord willing, we, we look forward to gathering here to worship you again next week and to study the parable of the lost son. We pray these things in the matchless name of your son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we are your sheep, but we may, we may be a little, a little dumb sometimes in the head, but we know we have the best shepherd we could ever ask for. He's rooting for us. He's taking care of us. And he chases after us when we go astray. And Father, I pray that we would take that and just, if you just give us comfort throughout this week and throughout these times that may seem like you're out of, it's out of control, Father, but we always know you're in control. You are the good shepherd overall. And Father, it is in your holy and precious name that I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.